Uh, Jeff Grove, ASTM. So, yeah, looking at diversifying models, we spend an awful lot of time, an awful lot of resources at doing that. It's not simple. Uh, training. Some organizations offset the loss in revenue sales through supplying training. Well, there's an awful lot of organizations and industries out there that are already providing training to ASTM standards. Uh, certification. We can move into certification. Guess what? Certification's a pretty heavily, uh, there's a, already a pretty built up industry around certification. Uh, so the problem is a lot more difficult than it sounds. It's, we're looking at it every day. We're spending a lot of time looking at, the, looking at how, can, how can we become more diverse and how can we find better models uh, to provide public access in ways that don't fundamentally disrupt what we do. And for us, it's coming back to, to trying to remain reasonable, trying to be flexible, trying to provide access in ways that uh, fit within our system. They cause us, they still cause us difficulties, but uh, things that we can live with and, and meet the regulatory agencies and the regulated public, uh, like, like the toy example that I mentioned earlier. So uh, it's a challenge. And, and we're not going to get there by January 1st uh, to, to help you with this, but we're, we're working on it. Can I just ask for perhaps um, Joe, you could clarify, or one of the other SDOs, about positive uses of the revenues that come from uh, the sales of standards. I know some standards developing organizations um, fund participation of um, state and local officials using revenues. Uh, others provide training. If you could speak about some of the current business models are not, not all about bringing money in, but the other uses of those revenues. And, and I'll just hit that before I get back to Jill. So in a, primarily where we've had this issue is in our consumer products work. Uh, so in that case, you have, you have organizations like Consumers Union, Consumer Federation of America, Safe Kids Worldwide. Well, we waive participation fees for, for those organizations because we need their voice at the table to reach good, high-quality, consensus-based documents. Uh, we provide travel support to get some of them to, to meetings when, when necessary to move the process forward. Uh, and we also do an awful lot of work in the developing world with developing countries uh, in providing a lot of our technical information. In fact, almost all of our standards uh, are available to the governments of developing countries to help them in implementing an infrastructure that ensures safety uh, it protects the environment in those kinds of areas. So that's a major initiative within our activities, and it's a major cost center for us as well. Joe Wendler from ASME. Um, I hit on this before, but, you know, not all of our standards generate revenue. A lot of our standards, uh, we might only sell five of them, but if those standards are in turn picked up by the likes of Walmart and Sears and enable them to kind of regulate um, products that from reaching the marketplace, we're happy to sell five of them because there's a conformity assessment process built in that protects the general public. So we operate numerous other standards activity at a loss that's not being operated by others. Um, as part of our engineering mission, we also focus on the developing world, and so the revenues that we use from standards development offset some of the things we do, like uh, focusing on the base of the pyramid for people who need access to water, electricity, power, and things like that. So we kind of have a humanitarian mission that is somewhat subsidized by our standards model. Um, like others, we're trying to diversify, um, but, you know, there's no good solution. If you, look at, if you hear people complain about standards, you should hear them complain about the cost of conformity assessment. Um, and so, you know, that's, you know, people uh, don't like to be regulated. They don't like to have more um, tests to perform. You know, they don't want to buy a $50 standard. They don't want to conduct a $2,000 test. So, so we're looking at that, but that's also a, a tough road to go. And then, as, as others have said, with training and development, we are growing our training to kind of help people use these standards rather than just rely on selling them. But again, we are competing with private entities who have been doing training um, for workforce for a long time, and we're, we're you know, slowly building up our competency in that area. David Halpern, um, representing Public Resource. Um, a lot of the discussion has been about what will happen to the SDOs if, if this is becomes, if this law is implemented and if it becomes a trend. And I've kind of resisted joining that discussion because I think it's a little patronizing in a way to, for me to tell you my opinion of what you ought to do with your business. Um, but I do believe in the SDOs and that they're intelligent people, capable people. 
um, very competent people. I, I, I will point out that CEOs of some of the SDOs make as much as $7 million a year, $2 million a year. So their talent, the talent is there. Um, again, I just want to say that, as, as has been pointed out, this is not about making all standards available for free, just those incorporated by reference. As Maureen's presentation showed, people buy standards that are available online. People buy the books because they want a book in the field, because the book may be annotated. There are things you can value you can add. There's also value that you can add online. The Bible is online. People buy Bibles. Shakespeare is online. Lots of public domain things. People still go out and buy a book for all kinds of reasons. So I think that the fact that there is that something becomes available doesn't mean that there aren't revenue streams around it. And that's apart from all the other possibilities of, of other revenue streams. And all of that, again, has to be weighed against the other side of this. All the benefits to all the other people who are not uh, running SDOs and not working at SDOs who benefit from access to the law. And, and again, our view that, that the law requires under the cases and just under the idea that we have an open society and a society that benefits from openness, um, making these standards available to all people. So I think that in some ways it is, it is a constructive thing to look at in implementing this law, how do the SDOs thrive in an environment where the law is implemented. But I don't, I don't think we should lose sight of the fact that there are, it's not, this is not done for no reason. Congress did it for a reason, which is they see the benefits and in some ways the imperatives of putting these standards uh, online and making them available to first responders, citizens, nonprofits, and businesses. Roberta Winters, League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania. One of the things I was taken by in all of the panels was the discussion about the private and public partnership that exists within this regulatory framework. And I was wondering if, as so many people try to generate more revenue, if along with a link from the regulation to the SDOs, if there might also be on the SDO sites advertising. That's one way that many nonprofits are making revenue. So I'm wondering if we could use private advertising within the SDOs. Thank you. The, the answer is, I think, I'll speak for NACE. We sure do. We have advertising in, in the magazine and website and everything, and there's lots of different kinds of revenue. Uh, I guess the, the, the first answer is um, we make money on some things and we lose money on some things. For NACE, our purpose is to protect people, assets, and the environment against the effects of corrosion. Remarkably similar mission or, or uh, purpose as to FEMSA. And so we do a lot of things that lose money exactly because it, because it meets uh, or serves that mission, uh, that purpose. Uh, we like to have our standards referenced by federal regulation. Why? Because it serves the mission. If more people use the best available corrosion technology, we feel that our mission is best served. Uh, that's, that's all a very positive thing. Uh, and the, the, the real comment I want to make is maybe about, you know, I don't think anybody should feel sorry for standard development organizations, right? I can guarantee you, being the, being the president, I know what the executive director makes, and it's nothing like that. I can guarantee you that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, I'm sorry. Um, the, the, po the point is not we don't feel sorry for the SDOs, but rather, those are the people that are now creating the best available technology containing documents. And if those SDOs don't provide that service anymore or can't make that their business work, then we lose that resource of, of technology that's used in a uniform and consensus way. If I could explore the last few comments, put them together and ask the, ask the question this way. Everybody appreciates the fact that if these documents were available for free on the web, we'd be much better off. I think Everybody agrees that we're all better off by having the SDOs developing these things, at least some of them. Let's, let's not say that every one of them does an excellent job for us. I know there's some concern about that. But if you take, take the best of the best, we want those standards. We want to be able to use them. We could, they'll be better than what we could put together. They could be done more quickly than we could do it. How do we balance those two things? 
David makes the point that this is supposed to be available for free. You make the point that these are very valuable standards. So if we were to say, let, let's assume we had the ability to work out some kind of a compromise here, is time a factor? Because, Joe, you were, for example, pointing out you're trying to develop alternative revenue sources. So if instead of January 1st of 2013, the deadline were January 1st of 2016 or 2018, and at that time we had to cut off the use of those standards and go to our own, would you think that by that time you would have a business case that would allow us to post them online for free or, or link directly to yours? Is, is there some solution here where we are all, are you all heading in that direction? I, don't reali I realize we don't have everybody in the room. But it looks like a lot of you are, if not there already, to provide, able to provide them for free. You're trying to change your business models a little bit and get there. And I, again, I, you may not be comfortable in a public forum addressing that, but uh, I'd, I'd like to know where there's room for us to, to work out a solution, if at all possible. Maureen Brodoff, National Fire Protection Association. Uh, I just think that the jury is out on that, whether we could ever create a business model that, that would replace the current business model in a way that met our, our resource needs and that also enabled us to have the kind of independence that, that we desire. Um, that said, some, for some organizations, we can provide free access, but it has to be rule-bound and limited to uh, and give us the flexibility going forward to explore how much we can expand that, that free access and still uh, derive copyright protected revenues. Um, the point about advertising is an interesting one. I personally find it depressing that, that the whole, that every, um, all uh, valuable intellectual content should be uh, used as a freemium to sell advertising, which seems to be the model that many people advocate. Um, but there is one example on Cornell um, Legal Information Institute provides a lot of uh, free content in terms of actual public domain um, rules and regulations that have been adopted by governments. And I've noticed in the last year or so they have tried to add advertising through Google Ads and the like as a sidebar to the Code of Federal Regulations or whatever they post. I don't know what their success has been with that, but um, it is one way uh, to at least try to uh, make some additional revenues. It's not something NFPA has, has done or been all that anxious to do. Um, but again, it, that kind of flexibility in terms of how you um, define the kind of free access you'd find acceptable um, would be important in terms of us figuring out going forward how we could at least offset the loss of revenue from any additional free access we provide.